welcome to the History of Rome. Episode 39, The Young Julius Caesar Chronicles. Last time, we covered Catiline's ill-fated conspiracy during the consulship of Cicero in 63 BC. This week, I want to backtrack a bit and fill in some of the gaps on our way to the formation of the alliance between Pompey, Crassus, and Julius Caesar in 60 BC, now called the First Triumvirate. In the aftermath of Spartacus's slave revolt, Pompey and Crassus had served as co-consuls, and though they functioned well enough publicly, personally, they were bitter rivals, or at least Crassus was bitter rivals with Pompey. I'm not really sure how much thought Pompey ever gave to Crassus. After their shared consulship, they were glad to be rid of each other. It was not until a decade later that they were brought together again, this time by a man who would soon be consul himself and desperately needed allies in his coming flame war with the Senate, Gaius Julius Caesar. And when I say fill in some gaps, it turns out what I really meant is write a sprawling, double-length episode on Caesar's early career. Gaius Julius Caesar was born in 100 BC into the ancient patrician Julii family. Though the family traced their lineage back to Aeneas, and thus to the goddess Venus herself, they had, in recent generations, fallen on hard times. While they always maintained respectability, they had long since passed to the margins of Roman political life. Caesar's particular branch was on the margins of Roman economic life as well, and the boy grew up in a neighborhood called the Subaru, which was far, both geographically and culturally, from the estates of his fellow patrician nobles on the Palatine Hill. I think it goes without saying that being raised in what amounted to a tenement building owned by his parents had a great impact on Caesar's later populist politics. Yes, he had impeccable patrician credentials, but Caesar would always identify himself with the common man and position himself as their champion. His childhood and early career were defined by two women, his mother, Aurelia, and his aunt, Julia. With his father, also named Gaius Julius Caesar, forever away on state business and dead by the time Caesar was 15, it was up to his mother to raise him. An intelligent, independent woman, highly regarded in Rome at the time, and held up as the ideal Roman woman by later historians, she came from a family of consuls and made sure that her son had the education and grooming necessary to follow in the footsteps of his maternal forefathers. The other great woman in Caesar's life was his Aunt Julia, who was married to none other than our old friend Gaius Marius. The marriage had been a boon to both families, as Marius needed patrician endorsement to keep his political career moving forward, and the Julii needed the money and fame that Marius brought with him. Though Caesar and Marius probably had limited contact with one another, the marriage joined Caesar at the hip to Marius politically, in some years for better, and in some years, obviously, for the worse. It is a testament, though, to the esteem Julia was held in, that when Sulla returned to Rome, the wife of his worst enemy, and mother of the young man he had so recently defeated on the battlefield, was herself left off the prescription lists. Caesar's first step into public life was very nearly his last. At the age of 16, while Cinna ruled Rome and Sulla was off fighting Mithridates, Caesar was named Flamen Dialis, or Priest of Jupiter. One of the oldest priesthoods in Rome, it was also smothered by archaic and bizarre traditions that, among other things, required the priest to wear a pointed hat at all times, forbade him from seeing a dead body, riding a horse, wearing knots on his clothing, or, critically, being absent from the city for even a single night. It also required that the priest be married to a patrician, so Caesar was arranged to be married to the daughter of Cinna, which, briefly, made him the son-in-law to the most powerful man in Rome. Not that this connection would do him any good personally, of course, as the appointment of the flame of Dialis precluded any political or military career. Luckily for the ambitious Caesar, the appointment was for life. But really luckily for Caesar, Sulla returned and the appointment was nullified. The new dictator cleared the city of his enemies, and he had no use for Cinna's son-in-law and Marius' nephew in any public position. He demanded further that Caesar divorce Cornelia, Cinna's daughter, but in an act of reckless or bold defiance, depending on your point of view, Caesar refused. After this, Sulla decided that he had no use for Cinna's son-in-law and Marius' nephew, period, and young Caesar found his name on the prescription list. At the age of 19, Caesar ran for his life into the Italian countryside, hiding out with sympathetic relatives and keeping on the move. But in the city, his mother, representative Vestal Virgins, and allies of Sulla with familial connections to the young fugitive, 
pleaded with Sulla to remove Caesar's name from the list. Finally, with his hold on power more secure, Sulla let himself be persuaded, and Caesar was allowed to come out of hiding. In 80 BC, the 20-year-old Caesar knew that he was borrowing trouble by remaining in the city, and got himself attached to the military staff of the governor of Asia. He would keep his head down and try to advance his career abroad, at least until Sulla was gone and the coast was truly clear. In Asia, Caesar served with distinction and was awarded the civic crown for his role in winning the siege of Mytilene. For the rest of his life, whenever he wore the simple oak wreath, all men, from the lowliest beggar to the greatest senator, would be required to stand when he entered a public festival. Caesar loved wearing the crown, delighting in how much it annoyed his senatorial enemies to stand respectfully in acknowledgment of what a brave soldier and all-around wonderful guy he was. But the siege of Mytilene would also prove the source of persistent glee for those same enemies. In order to break the resistance of the city, which was located on Turkey's Aegean coast, the Romans needed naval reinforcement. Caesar was sent to Bithynia to request aid from King Nicomedes, who, you will recall, will die in a few years, leaving his kingdom to Rome and touching off the last Mithridatic War. But Caesar seems to have done a little too well on his mission, and lingered a little too long in Bithynia while doing it, and rumors began to fly that he had carried on an affair with King Nicomedes. Caesar denied it all his life, but it did not stop his enemies from referring to him as the Queen of Bithynia, nor did it stop graffiti from later showing up on the walls of Rome that read, Caesar conquered Gaul, but Nicomedes conquered Caesar. When Sulla died in 78 BC, it was finally safe for Caesar in Rome, so he returned from Asia and began a legal career that would fill his time and enhance his reputation while he waited to begin the climb up the Cursus Honorum. Like Cicero, Caesar would make a name for himself as a distinguished orator, while combating the excessive corruption of greedy proconsuls. But unlike Cicero, his efforts were largely wasted on losing efforts, and his words were no match for the bribes his defendants used in order to avoid prosecution. But win or losing mattered little to Caesar in the long run. It was only important that powerful men acknowledged his oratorical skill, and that unimportant men knew that he was on their side. In an effort to build on his natural rhetorical talent, Caesar arranged to be tutored in Rhodes by the same master Greek who had brought Cicero's skills to such great heights. But he never reached the city. Along the way, his ship was attacked by Cilician pirates. Caesar was captured and held for ransom, a typical and lucrative practice among the pirates of the day. The pirates took a liking to their hostage almost immediately. Discovering that they were asking only 20 talents for him, Caesar was outraged and demanded that they ask for no less than 50. The pirates agreed to this humorous demand, and Caesar sent away a few of his slaves to collect the money. For the next 40 days, Caesar lived with the pirates, never once showing any sign of the terror the pirates were used to seeing in their victims. He ate his meals with them, participated in athletic contests, demanded that they keep it down while he was trying to sleep, and generally acted as if the whole affair was no big deal. He also joked that when he was free, he was going to raise a fleet, come back, and crucify the whole lot of them. They laughed, of course, but when the ransom was paid and Caesar was let go, he immediately raised a fleet and did just that. He returned to his place of capture, sacked the hideout, and mercilessly crucified his former captors. Well, I shouldn't say mercilessly, he did slit their throats before posting them on the cross. Caesar remained in Asia after his pirate adventure and raised a local militia to help defend Roman interests from the allies of Mithridates, but was recalled to Rome in 73 to join a spot in the priesthood vacated by his recently deceased cousin. Unlike the restrictive Flamidialis, this new priesthood carried with it no arcane restrictions, and in the same year, Caesar was elected military tribune, his first official step in the Cursus Honorum. It is likely, though not verified, that Caesar served in Crassus's legions during the slave revolt during this time. In 69, he took his next step and was elected quaestor for a term to be served in Spain. But before he left, he was hit with a tragedy. His Aunt Julia passed away. And in response, the bold and unpredictable young man was, well, bold and unpredictable. It was customary for the head of the household, Caesar in this case, to deliver a funeral oration in the forum for the deceased matron. But Caesar took things one step further. 
Since the reign of Sulla, Gaius Marius had been legally declared persona non grata in Rome, and his likeness was banned from the public sphere. But funeral processions of noble women usually included a depiction of their husbands. Caesar never hesitated, and marched through the streets of Rome at the head of a column that bore with it images of Gaius Marius, images that had not been seen publicly for more than a decade. Throughout the city, citizens and former soldiers began remembering Marius not for what he was in his final years, but for the great man who had picked beggars up from the slums and made them honorable soldiers, who had ended the needlessly extended war with Jugurtha, and who had defeated the invading Gauls. This procession marked the beginning of Marius's rehabilitation, and earned Caesar much acclaim from the common people for whom Marius had done so much. The conservative Senate, who would have been fine never hearing the name Marius again, were annoyed, but there was little they could do to censor Caesar after the outpouring of goodwill from the masses. But that wouldn't be the only tragedy that befell Caesar, nor the last time the people would embrace him before he left for Spain. Not long after Julia's death, Cornelia, the wife Caesar had defied Sulla to stand beside, suddenly died. There were traditions dictating who deserved funeral orations in the forum, and young women almost never qualified for the honor. But Caesar defied convention and delivered a moving eulogy for Cornelia. Whether it was his intention or just a lucky byproduct, the common people of Rome were moved by his obvious grief-stricken love. This was not just another stoic noble. This was a man with a heart, a man of passion. They loved him for it. Eventually Caesar did make it to Spain, and while there, began to set up a network of clients, subjects, and allies that would serve him well for the rest of his career. Wherever he went, Caesar brought with him a reputation for fair dealing, competent administration, and mercy. He always governed with a stern but understanding hand. When Spanish debtors were being hounded into insolvency by their Roman creditors, for example, Caesar managed to broker a deal limiting the allowed wage garnishment percentage. But in his apparent populism, Caesar was savvy enough not to alienate the lenders who were a. the men who could make or break his further political career, and b. the very men who Caesar would be borrowing money from to advance that political career. The wage garnishment limit was thus set at 66%. Enough that the lenders did not feel cheated, but not so much that the borrowers were run out of their homes. It was the kind of practical administrative decision-making that was the hallmark of Caesar's career. Much is made of his military acumen, but he was as deft with legislation as he was with the sword. His laws, as we will see moving forward, were brilliantly written, impossible to attack, realistic in scope, and functional in implementation. Honestly, as dictators go, Julius Caesar was a man at least capable of doing the job right. When his work in Spain was completed, Caesar made his way back to Rome along the Mediterranean coast through Gaul. On the European side of the Alps, and then on the Italian side, Caesar moved slowly, lending a sympathetic ear to the populace, settling disputes, and generally ingratiating himself with the community. As in Spain, he earned a broad base of support that he could count on for the rest of his life, particularly, of course, during the Gallic campaigns a few years hence. Back in Rome, Caesar remarried, this time choosing to the surprise of everyone the granddaughter of Sulla. While the arrangement seemed to signal a shift towards more conservative policies, Caesar used the benefits of the familial ties he gained without letting it interfere with his populist politics. Savvy and unpredictable, 100% pure Caesar. His career continued to advance and he was placed in charge of the Appian Way, a highly covered administrative post, and then was elected aedile. While serving in both functions, Caesar borrowed enormous sums of money to fund public works projects, festivals, gladiatorial games, and all manner of minor expenses. It was all for the good of Rome, and his career, of course, but the scope of the debt was staggering, and Caesar's life would be defined for years by his running battles with, and sometimes literally running away from, his creditors. It was during this period that his alliance with Crassus was really solidified. Anyone with half a brain could see that Caesar was a man on the rise, and Crassus was no dummy. Yes, he was rich beyond measure, but he lacked the kind of charisma that oozed out of Caesar. By patronizing the young noble, Crassus was making sure both that Caesar never became his enemy, 
and that some of the magic would rub off on old Scrooge McCrassus. And Caesar needed patronage. Numerous times, Crassus stepped in when Caesar's creditors were working themselves into a murderous frenzy, and pledged himself as security against default. This would generally quell the immediate uproar, leaving Caesar free to continue planting his seed money across the Roman Empire. He wasn't just investing in any old career. As he once said to a compatriot while passing through a tiny village in Gaul, he would rather be the first man there than second man in Rome. Power of the kind Caesar sought was expensive. But there was only so much Crassus could do to help. After his term as Aedile, Caesar next needed a post that did not just push him further into the red, he needed to at least make some move towards the black. So in 63 BC, the same year as the Catalinian Conspiracy, he took the unprecedented step of running for Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of Rome. It was not only an important position politically, but came with it numerous opportunities to generate personal income. The thing was, normally the Pontifex Maximus was an elderly statesman near the end of his career. It was unheard of for a man so young to aspire to the office. But Caesar needed to do something bold quickly, or he would be consumed by his debt. Upon leaving for the forum on the day of his election, Caesar told his mother, When I return, you will either find me high priest or an exile. Melodrama aside, the outcome was in little doubt. Caesar had bribed all the key electors to ensure that democracy did not interfere with the election. This lifetime appointment greatly enhanced Caesar's reputation as well as his financial portfolio. It also came with it an official residence, which moved his family from the out-of-the-way home in the Subaru he had known his whole life, right into the heart of the most prestigious neighborhood in Rome. But the office of Pontifex Maximus was part-time at best, and did not preclude the office holder from pursuing military or political office. So later in that same year, Caesar ran for and won a praetorship, leaving him one step away from the highest office in Rome. Throughout this period, in his role both as high priest and praetor, Caesar openly supported the allies of Pompey in the Senate and popular assemblies. Pompey was wrapping up his eastern campaigns and sending home instructions that his conquests needed to be ratified and that his veterans would need land upon their return to Italy. Caesar had already distinguished himself as one of the few senators to support Pompey's grant of Mediterranean Imperium to fight the pirates a few years earlier, and spent his time now backing whatever Pompey indicated he required. With his eye on the consulship, and his dreams of reforming practically everything about the way the empire was administered, Caesar was keenly aware of the need for powerful friends. His populist stances and obviously high ambition had won him no friends in the Senate. If he was going to do half of what he planned, he would need a way to blunt the obstruction as senators. Caesar recognized Pompey as the perfect ally, a wildly popular general who made the Senate as queasy as Caesar seemed to make them. By supporting Pompey now, Caesar hoped that when the general came home, the favor would be returned. When his praetorship ended, Caesar was named proconsular governor of Hispania Ulterior, or Further Spain a province that hugged the southern coast of Spain from roughly modern-day Valencia to the Atlantic. The governorship was a turning point in Caesar's career. It gave him his first crack at true military command, which, as you can imagine, he excelled at brilliantly, but it also set him up in a position to really make some money. Governorships of the provinces during this period was seen by most Roman politicians as their reward for the sacrifices and financial investments they had made on behalf of the state over the course of their careers. The personal milking of the provinces was not a scandal unless it reached egregious proportions. It was one of the things Caesar intended to change if he was ever given the chance. Anyone who thought about it could see that the annual arrival of some new governor who planned to make himself rich on the backs of the provincials was not a sustainable practice. Eventually, the cow would be milked dry. But, while it was something Caesar intended to change, he had major, major debts to worry about. So upon arrival, he promptly picked a fight with the hill tribes in the west that had never been fully pacified and drove them off, seizing the lucrative silver mines they controlled at the same time. This meant more revenue for the state, massive amounts of cash for Caesar himself, and, bonus, territorial expansion for the empire, the thing that triumphs are made of. And upon completion of this little war in Spain, Caesar 
demanded just that. The Senate had no desire to grant Caesar his triumph, but there was no denying what he had accomplished. But Caesar further indicated that he intended to run for the consulship that year as well. The prospect of the wildly popular Caesar returning in triumph from Spain and immediately taking the reins of power petrified the Senate. But what could they do? Into this dilemma stepped Cato the Younger, leader of the conservative faction in the Senate, defender of Republican virtue, an implacable foe of Caesar, who proposed a way to at least hold off Caesar's consulship. In order to qualify for candidacy, a man had to be physically present in Rome. But, if a returning general entered the city before his triumph, the honor was nullified and the great victory parade canceled. As Caesar waited at Rome's gates, Cato did everything in his power to put the triumph off until after the deadline for candidate filing. Caesar asked for an exception to the rule, but the request was denied. Cato went so far as to filibuster all business on the final day of the senatorial session to prevent the triumph from being scheduled prior to the deadline. Cato left that evening feeling quite satisfied with himself. Surely vain Caesar would not pass up an opportunity for a triumph, which may only come around once in a lifetime, just to run for an office he was destined to win anyway. Imagine his shock when Caesar, bold and unpredictable Caesar, abandoned his opportunity for a triumph and entered the city. He would stand for election that year, an election he would win handily to serve as consul of Rome in 59 BC. Next week, we will delve into Caesar's eventful term in office, the reforms he tried to implement, and the reforms the Senate did everything in their power to block. But Caesar's support of Pompey did indeed pay off, and his long-standing relationship with Crassus was formalized in a secret pact to push forward the aims of all three men. The secret pact did not remain secret for long, though, for when Caesar stood before the popular assembly in order to bypass the opposition Senate, he was flanked by both Pompey and Crassus. It was instantly clear that the three most powerful men in Rome were working together, and as the masses cheered, the Senate cringed. How in the world could they stop this political juggernaut? <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 40, in the Consulship of Julius and Caesar. Last week, we followed Julius Caesar's rise up the Cursus Honorum, which was capped by a successful election to the consulship for a term to be served in 59 BC. On his way up the political ladder, Caesar had spent lavishly, bribed when necessary, made a lot of friends, and even more enemies. More than anything else, he had established himself as a man to be reckoned with. He was an able governor and a brilliant military commander, a master orator, and a shrewd politician. For most Romans, the consulship marked the end of a long career. For Julius Caesar, it was only the beginning. The consular elections that saw Caesar emerge triumphant was a dirty affair, one that saw rampant bribery on all sides. It was obvious that Caesar was going to win in a walk, so the important thing to the conservative Senate was to elect someone who would stand as a bulwark against any radical reforms they suspected Caesar would try and push through. To this end, they threw all their support behind Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, who had served as aedile alongside Caesar years earlier and forever bore a grudge against his former colleague for taking credit for things Bibulus himself had accomplished while in that office. That personal enmity, coupled with a naturally conservative worldview, made him the perfect foil for Caesar's charismatic populism. In anticipation of the struggle with the Senate, Caesar had been lining up support across the Roman world, men at all levels of society who would back him through thick and thin, some because they genuinely believed in Caesar's programs, some simply out of crass self-interest. Caesar spread bribes liberally and promises of patronage constantly. It made no matter to him, a vote was a vote was a vote, whether it came unsolicited or after a massive payoff. At the top of his pyramid of support, Caesar targeted three powerful men specifically. The first of these men was an obvious choice. Marcus Crassus had been a long-time backer of Caesar, and their alliance was already well known. But it bears repeating that Crassus was exceedingly wealthy and still dreamed of becoming a great military commander. Second, Caesar targeted Pompey the Great, 
who had struggled upon returning from the East to have his conquest ratified and his veterans settled. It took some deft maneuvering on Caesar's part to get Crassus and Pompey in the same room, but both were well aware that their own personal projects and aspirations could be realized easier with the help of the other. Last, Caesar made overtures to Rome's greatest lawyer and orator, Cicero. He appealed to Cicero's vision, intelligence, and legal savvy. The empire as presently constituted was unsustainable. Cicero could see that as well as anyone. But the conservative senate resisted all attempts at desperately needed reform. Caesar was offering Cicero the chance to have great influence over the course correction he planned for the empire. But Cicero rejected the mutual support pact, preferring to remain an independent, moderate voice. Thus was born the first triumvirate. Not its name at the time, nor a particularly accurate description of the wide network of supporters Caesar had aligned, but history gives us our shorthand labels and is often easier to simply use them rather than try to reinvent the wheel. The agreement between Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey was made official when they swore a solemn oath, administered by Caesar in his role as Pontifex Maximus, to undertake no action that opposed any of the others. Pretty simple, right? Well, Actually, yeah, it was pretty simple, and it worked, too. With his support lined up, Caesar wrapped up some unfinished business in his personal life. He needed to find a new wife. I neglected the scandal that led to his divorce from his second wife, Pompeia, last week, so before we delve into the details of Caesar's eventful consulship, I want to slide back a few years, as the man who sparked the scandal will feature prominently in the coming breakdown of civility between Caesar and Cicero. Each year, the rites of Bona Dea, the Roman goddess of fertility and healing, were performed in the home of the Pontifex Maximus. Men were excluded from the ceremony, so Caesar was out of the house, leaving his wife and mother in charge of the proceedings. Into this segregated affair slipped Publius Clodius Pulcher, a free-thinking, flamboyant loose cannon who loved thumbing his nose at stodgy Roman tradition. Clodius, dressed as a woman, lingered on the edges of the party until he was outed by Caesar's mother. It would have been bad enough for Caesar had the ceremony he sponsored simply been desecrated, but to make matters worse, it was widely rumored that Clodius was engaged in an affair with Pompeia and was taking Caesar's absence as an opportunity for a rendezvous. In response to the destructive chatter, Caesar acted quickly. He divorced Pompeia, for, whether she was guilty of the affair or not, quote, Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. The affair marked the last we will hear of Pompeia, but not the last we will hear of Clodius. I will also take this opportunity to note that while Caesar's wife must be above suspicion, Caesar himself was under no such obligation. Caesar cheated early and often on all of his wives, carrying on affairs with some of the most prominent women in Rome, including Servilia Capionis, who was at the same time the mother and mother-in-law of Caesar's two most famous assassins, Brutus and Cassius, respectively. While the affair was on, though, she was best known as the half-sister of Cato the Younger. Caesar played politics to win and knew he was getting Cato's goat, hopefully forcing the staunch conservative in his personal rage and embarrassment to get sloppy. Caesar finally settled on marrying the daughter of the statesman Lucius Calpurnius Piso, who would coincidentally follow Caesar in the consulship the next year. And with Calpurnia by his side, Caesar took the oath of office in 59 B.C., immediately setting to work on his reform program. First up, as agreed to by the three triumvirs, was a land redistribution program aimed primarily at Pompey's veterans, but further intended to alleviate the general problem of urban poverty that had become a chronic disease in Rome. Since the closing days of the Punic War, land ownership in Italy had become more and more centralized into fewer and fewer hands. The large landowning nobles further exacerbated the problem by importing slaves to work their estates rather than relying on a sharecropping system that would have kept locals tied to the land. These displaced ex-farmers flooded into Rome, putting enormous strain on the treasury and contributing to a general atmosphere of lawlessness in the growing slums and housing projects. And with so many of the landless being ex-soldiers, the possibility of violent uprisings was always just a few missed meals away. Caesar entered for the Senate's consideration a carefully written bill to address the issue. State-owned land would be opened up to settlement 
and state funds would be used to purchase further tracts from willing sellers at the land's assessed value. The money to do this would come from the treasure Pompey had brought back with him from the east, making the project cost neutral. In order to mollify the change adverse Senate, Caesar specifically exempted the rich lands of Campania, which had long been owned and operated by the nobles of Rome for their personal enrichment. But the exemption was not enough, and the Senate, though unable to voice a single constructive criticism of the bill, nonetheless stalled its passage. If they let Caesar pass such a popular bill, his influence would skyrocket off the charts, and they simply could not allow that to happen. Cato rose in opposition and began to talk, and talk, and talk, and talk. Pretty soon, it was clear that he intended to talk until the sun fell out of the sky. The merits of the bill were no longer in question. This was a naked stall tactic, pure and simple. Caesar grew impatient and then enraged at Cato, and in his fury made one of his few political miscalculations. He ordered that Cato be seized and hauled off to jail for obstructing senatorial business. The Senate was understandably shocked at one of their most respected members being hauled off to jail like a common criminal, and in protest walked out of the session en masse. Caesar caught a member who he knew to be at least sympathetic to his cause and asked why he too was leaving. The senator replied, I would rather be in jail with Cato than here with you. This harsh statement, coming from a friend no less, brought Caesar to his senses, and he ordered Cato released. But the battle over the bill was just heating up. When the Senate reconvened, Caesar announced that because the Senate was obviously intent on blocking the bill, no matter its merits, he would take his legislation, and all future legislation, directly to the people's assemblies. Now, at this point, the Senate simply knew that Caesar was a popular and charismatic politician. What they did not know about was the triumvirate alliance and that he had the power and resources to make good on his threat to bypass them completely from here on out. But the next day, as Caesar stood before the popular assembly, an assembly packed with Pompey's veterans, the Senate was in for a rude awakening. Standing beside Caesar were Crassus and Pompey. And when Pompey strode forward and announced his intention to back the legislation with his sword, if necessary, to the roaring approval of the crowd, the Senate realized the whole ball game had changed behind their backs. The secret pact was now out in the open. The question was, could the Senate do anything about it? Bibulus, Caesar's co-consul, swore to do everything in his power to prevent the bill from passing, despite the jeers and threats that rained down on his head by the increasingly unruly mob. Clearly, this was not a time for open confrontation, so Bibulus beat a hasty retreat to plan his next move. What he came up with was sneakily brilliant, obviously an abuse of power, but technically an insurmountable hurdle to Caesar's entire program. One of the functions of the consul is to decide which days over the course of the year will be considered holy days, on which no public business can be transacted. With the help of some conservative tribunes, Bibulus simply declared that every day left in his and Caesar's consulship was a holy day. Public business would be shuttered for the rest of the year. It was ridiculous, of course, and everyone saw it for what it was, but there was little Caesar could do about it. Without a legal leg to stand on, though, Caesar refused to be deterred. He pressed on for a vote on the land bill anyway, and decided to deal with the legal implications later. The people, at least, were with him. On the day of the vote, Caesar packed the forum with allies, and victory was never in any doubt. But Bibulus, much to the surprise of everyone, strode right into the belly of the beast and began denouncing the bill and declaring the proceedings illegal. The mob erupted in anger. Bibulus and his lictors were assaulted. A bucket of manure was dumped on the consul's head. And most importantly, his fasces, the symbol of consular authority, were broken. Bibulus fled from the scene. From that point on, he essentially retired from public life, spending the remainder of his consulship holed up in his house, refusing to come out. This was the origin of the satirical Roman quip that events of the year took place in the consulship of Julius and Caesar. With the opposition out of the way, the bill passed, and a land commission was created to oversee the redistribution. To ensure that there would be no conflicts of interest, Caesar declared that he would not take an active role in the project. Crassus and Pompey, however, both agreed to the honor of serving the people as commissioners. Nope, no conflicts of interest there. After the law took effect, however, it was clear that there was not enough land to fill all the requests. So, possibly for practical reasons, and almost certainly for personal ones, Caesar announced that he was granting the new land commission purview over Campania 
a.k.a. the Senate's backyard, just as he had promised not to do. Perhaps if the Senate had joined with me in the initial stages of the legislation and not ignored the will of the people for so long, etc., etc. Next up on Caesar's list was the ratification of Pompey's eastern campaign. The incorporation of Syria as a province and the treaties Pompey signed with new client states needed approval by the Senate to officially go into effect. Time had been of the essence for a while now, as these territories directly bordered the Parthian Empire. If things were left in doubt for too long, it was likely the Parthians would take advantage of the uncertainty and reverse the gains Pompey had made on Rome's behalf. The Senate, cowed by Caesar, and knowing full well they should have taken care of this business years ago anyway, ratified all of Pompey's actions. But this victory left Caesar with a problem. Everything Pompey hoped to gain by joining the triumvirate had been gained. His men had land and his conquests were legal. In anticipation of this inevitability, Caesar offered Pompey his daughter Julia in marriage. Pompey agreed to the arrangement and just like that, Caesar became Pompey's father-in-law. The man who was to become Julia's husband was shocked when his prospective bride was pulled out from under him, but Pompey offered his daughter to the young man in exchange. All of this prompted Cato to spit that it was disgusting how Roman power was now based on the trading of women. By all accounts, though, the marriage between Pompey and Julia was a happy arrangement, full of genuine love. And as hard as it is to believe today, this genuine love actually raised eyebrows in the aristocracy of Rome, and Pompey was subjected to endless jokes. Get a load of Pompey. He actually loves his wife. Caesar's final piece of legislation proved to be perhaps his greatest legacy. The Lex Julia de Repetundici, the Julian Law of Extortion. It was a voluminous and detailed set of rules governing the do's and don'ts of provincial administration. It set the ground rules and guidelines for the acceptance of gifts and set limits on the amount that a governor could personally benefit from his term in office. With one sweeping bill, Caesar modernized imperial administration overnight and brought the rule of law to a corrupt and inefficient system, if it could even be called a system. The Lex Julia was a huge success and remained in effect with few additions or subtractions long into the Byzantine age. Though it was obvious that Caesar was undertaking much needed reform, his term in office also showed he was willing to ignore laws, tradition, and common decency to get his way. The assault on Bibulus was particularly troubling to Cicero, who began to shift away from moderate accommodation of Caesar to a more confrontational posture. While arguing in defense of his ex-co-consul against a corruption charge backed by Caesar, Cicero took the opportunity to stray from the facts of the case into a broad indictment of Caesar and his tactics. Caesar was furious at what he perceived to be Cicero's betrayal. He had always done his best to cultivate a cordial relationship with the great lawyer and seemed to actually respect Cicero. Now, the master orator was suddenly turning his considerable skill against Caesar, and it was too much for him to let go. In retaliation, Caesar decided to cut loose Clodius, he of the Bona Dea scandal. Clodius was a rabid opponent of all things conservative and bore a special hatred for the pompous and vain Cicero. But because of the enemies he had made over the years, the patrician Clodius found himself publicly blacklisted from pursuing high office. So he hatched a plan to throw away his patrician status, an unthinkable act, so he became tribune of the plebs. The fix was simple. He just needed to be formally adopted by a pleb. Thus, as lineage was patriarchal, he would immediately cease to be a patrician. But he couldn't find anyone willing to make his proposed adoption legal. After Cicero's scathing indictment, however, Caesar, as Pontifex Maximus and consul, decided to validate Clodius's adoption. The iconoclastic loose canon was adopted by a pleb half his age and immediately announced his candidacy for the tribunate. Once he had some power at his disposal, he planned to unleash the full brunt of it on Cicero and against anything else he deemed decadent and worthless. Caesar hoped to maintain some influence over Clodius, but it would soon become clear that having attained the tribunate, Clodius considered himself beholden to no one. With his consulship winding down, Caesar had two overarching concerns. First, he had to ensure that his reforms, now enacted, would not immediately be repealed, and second, he had to make sure that he was protected from personal prosecution. 
His enemies in the Senate were compiling a long list of charges that they would bring against him the minute he became a private citizen. If Caesar did not secure a nice long proconsulship, he was liable to be hauled into court and destroyed. Now, it would have been unthinkable for Caesar to receive no proconsulship at all. So the Senate laid the groundwork for his consular imperium to extend to the fields and pastures of Italy. It would have been an embarrassing assignment and would have denied Caesar access to both personal enrichment and military command. They intended for Caesar to command the streams of Italy for a year and then return to Rome a private citizen, whereupon they would crucify him, perhaps literally. Toward the first major concern, securing the continuation of his new laws, Caesar took two steps. First, he ensured that his new father-in-law would be elected consul the next year. Caesar could then rest assured, knowing he would leave office with a staunch ally standing ready to veto any attempt to alter his laws. Second, and I really love this bit, he introduced a curse clause into the oath of the consulship. Upon taking office, incoming consuls would have to swear not to undo Caesar's work, because if they did, they would, well, be cursed. This was a very big deal to the superstitious Romans, and though I doubt it would work today, I would love, love to see stuff like this get written into bills and oaths of office today. By the way, you can't mess with my highway works project, because if you do, the gods will flood your district. That kind of thing. It may not work, but it sure would make the process a whole lot more fun. Towards the second major concern, protecting himself from prosecution, Caesar held true to form and simply ignored the Senate and their plans for him to serve a meaningless proconsulship. With the help of sympathetic, read, bribed, tribunes, and the tacit support of his fellow triumvirs, Caesar conspired to have the People's Assembly assign him a lucrative post that would keep him out of the clutches of his enemies and, most importantly for his wider ambitions, offer him the chance at some good old-fashioned military conquest. Today, Everyone knows Caesar primarily as the great general he proved to be. But at this point in his career, as you may have noticed over the last two episodes, Caesar was known primarily as a lawyer and politician who had had some military success in Spain, and as a soldier had been brave, but nothing to write home about. He craved the opportunity to leave civilian life behind and throw himself into a great campaign on behalf of Rome. The question, then, was where best to geographically position himself in the empire to maximize the possibility of becoming engaged in military action. His choices were limited to the east, where he could possibly expand on Pompey's acquisitions, North Africa, where Egypt still stood ripe for the plucking, and the Gallic provinces in the north. North Africa was out because Egypt secured its continued independence by way of massive bribes, and they made sure Caesar's pockets were as lined as everyone else's. The far east was out, as any future expansion would come at the expense of the Parthians. And as great as a commander as Caesar believed himself to be, there was not much upside in picking a fight with the heirs of the Persian Empire in the middle of the desert. Just ask Crassus. That left the Gallic provinces. Specifically, Caesar had his eye on Cisalpine Gaul, or, literally, Gaul on this side of the Alps. The region north of the Po Valley stood in perfect strategic position. To the northwest stood European Gaul, or, as the Romans sometimes called it, the land of the long-haired Gaul. To the north lay the warlike Germanic tribes, who were always stirring up trouble. And to the northeast lay the unconquered lands on the far side of the Danube River. Plus, by securing the proconsulship of Cisalpine Gaul, Caesar would control the legions closest to Rome itself, allowing him to keep an eye on his enemies in the Senate. When everything shook out, the People's Assembly granted Caesar the proconsulship of Cisalpine Gaul for a period of five years. The Senate was furious, but the Assembly's decree went through before they could stop it. Almost as an afterthought, but of monumental importance to Roman and world history, the People's Assembly also granted Caesar the province of Transalpine Gaul, or Gaul on the far side of the Alps. Thus situated, all he needed was an excuse. Almost as if on cue, Caesar got his excuse. The delicate balance of power between the Gallic and Germanic tribes began to break down, and a tribe of Gauls living alongside Lake Geneva decided that they had had enough of marauding Germans. They would pack up their entire civilization and move down out of the mountains. They planned on moving into Roman territory, which may be a problem for them, but surely the Roman governor, what's his name, Kaiser, 
would be a reasonable man. Surely he won't build a giant wall blocking our migration. Next week, Caesar will build a giant wall blocking the migration of the Helvetii, which would prove to be the opening chapter of some of the most famous campaigns in history, collectively called the Gallic Wars. Welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 41A, The Gallic Wars. At the end of last week, Caesar had succeeded in immunizing himself from prosecution by securing a proconsulship in Cisalpine Gaul for a period of five years. Over the course of his career, he had ignored tradition, law, morality, and good taste, and his enemies in the Senate were salivating at the opportunity to see him in court. Caesar was guilty of sin of the charges that would be brought against him as soon as he left public office. So for the sake of his career, and possibly his life, it was imperative that he never return to Rome as a private citizen. As we will see, it was this legal axe hanging over his head as much as anything else that led him to cross the Rubicon in that fateful year of 49 BC. But that was still a decade away. Now, in the year 58 BC, Caesar took over the governorship of Gaul setting the stage for one of the most famous military campaigns in history. And not to take anything away from the skill and daring Caesar displayed while in Gaul, but the real reason the Gallic Wars are so famous is because Caesar wanted them to be famous. The thing that really shines through, more than his tactical ability or engineering accomplishments or strategic vision, was his brilliant flair for propaganda. Caesar was the unparalleled master of self-promotion that his commentaries on the war in Gaul is still required reading for Latin language courses today, speaks for itself. At the time Caesar took control of Cis and Transalpine Gaul, the land north of the Mediterranean basin was, from the Roman perspective, an uncivilized land populated by barbaric tribes. But civilized is a relative term, and though to Roman eyes the Gauls were, quote, uncivilized, this does not mean that they were mindless brutes. True, there was no centralized government, and the basic political unit was still the tribe. But there were towns, craftsmen, religion, money, ornamentation, literacy, and political intrigue. I think the proper analogy here is the European arrival in the New World. The native Indians were dismissed as primitive by the civilized Europeans, but I think anyone who takes even a cursory glance at the workings of, say, the Iroquois Confederacy would be hard-pressed to argue that there was not a sophisticated civilization at work prior to the arrival of Western settlers. The same is true of the Gauls. To the average clean-shaven Roman, the long-haired Gaul must have seemed like something out of a primordial nightmare, but I think that there was a lot less separating them than either side would have cared to admit. Independent Gaul encompassed what is today France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and parts of Switzerland. The Romans controlled the southernmost territory in the Mediterranean basin, but since their days of initial expansion during the Punic Wars, they had shown little interest in moving north and seemed content to simply control the land route to the rich province of Hispania. In the east, Gaul was understood to end at the Rhine River, across which lay Germania. The relationship between the Gauls, the Germans, and who's doing what on whose side of the Rhine will be of great importance not only to the unfolding Gallic Wars, but for the rest of Roman history, as the Rhine River will eventually stand as the official border of the Roman Empire. In 58 BC, the Helvetii, a Celtic tribe who lived around Lake Geneva, grew tired of dealing with the encroaching German tribes. They decided to pack up their entire civilization and move out of the mountains, intent on resettling in lowland Gaul. According to Master of Propaganda Caesar, the Helvetii numbered somewhere north of 350,000, with roughly 100,000 of those being able-bodied men. Their total number was probably more like 100 to 150,000, with 30 to 50,000 being able-bodied men. Not quite the vast horde Caesar makes them out to be, but still large enough to be a terrible menace to the tribes they would transplant when they arrived to build their new home. They moved down through a valley until they arrived at the border of Transalpine Gaul, which they hoped to pass through so as to avoid moving through Free Gaul, which was full of tribes who had no interest in the Helvetii migrating into their lands. At this point, they sent envoys to meet Caesar and request safe passage through Roman territory. Caesar agreed to consider the request and asked for the envoys to return at a later specified date to receive an answer. 
but Caesar had no intention of letting the Helvetii pass and was simply stalling for time while he gathered his legions and built a huge fortified wall from one end of the narrow valley to the other. When the Helvetian envoys returned, the giant wall they ran into spoke for itself. Caesar's answer was no. There is no doubt that from the very beginning of his governorship, Caesar was looking for any opportunity to exploit perceived belligerence as an excuse to invade Greater Gaul. The Helvetian migration was simply the first opportunity that presented itself, and Caesar wasn't going to pass up an excuse to pick a fight. For the record, there was probably a real concern that the Helvetii's migration would do serious damage to the balance of power in the region, and as governor of the neighboring province, Caesar had an interest in keeping the region stable. But you get the feeling that the Helvetii could have been looking for a place to plant a nice flower garden to brighten everyone's day, and Caesar still would have poked them in the eye with a stick. The Helvetii, though, were not looking for a place to plant a nice flower garden. They were warriors through and through, and reacted the way warriors react when someone pokes them in the eye with a stick. They attacked. But the Roman engineers had done their job with the fortifications, and the legionaries did their job with the fighting, and the Helvetii were easily repulsed. So the migrating Celts had no choice but to head north and pass through hostile Gallic territory. Caesar quickly returned to the Italian side of the Alps, picked up three legions he had in reserve, and raised two more from the local population. When the Helvetii spilled into Gaul, Caesar would be ready in case the call for aid arrived. Right on cue, an allied tribe ransacked by the incoming Helvetii sent a mission to beg the Romans for aid. They found Caesar more than willing to help his poor beleaguered allies drive off the nasty Helvetii. Were the allied tribes asking for his legions to march into their territory? Yes, yes, the missions replied. Intervention formally requested. Caesar had his legal cover. The Roman invasion of Gaul had begun. Caesar caught up with the Helvetii as they crossed what is today the Sone River, near the border between Switzerland and France. He waited while three-quarters of the Celts were across the river, and then, with only 25% left on the east bank, charged in and attacked, annihilating the far smaller group while their comrades watched on from the far bank. The Helvetans were incensed at this cowardly move. Their sense of honor demanded open conflict between two armies, with lots of opportunities for individual bravery. They did not understand an enemy that would intentionally launch a surprise attack against a much weaker force. They drew the conclusion that the Romans were afraid of facing the full Helvetian army. They should have drawn the conclusion that Caesar didn't care a whit about Celtic honor. He was just going to systematically destroy them. With the bulk of the Helvetans, though, now loose in greater Gaul, Caesar knew he would not be able to simply pick around the edges for long. He followed the Helvetii into modern France, but in doing so, made a strategic decision that would come back to haunt him. In order to stay mobile during the invasion, Caesar decided to forego establishing a secure supply line back to Roman territory. Instead, he intended to live off the land and off the supplies he demanded from his Gallic allies. This was a risky decision that very nearly ended the invasion before it really began. See, not all the Gallic tribes, not even the tribes technically allied with Rome, were super excited about a Roman army rampaging around their territory. Not only was it dangerous in the immediate sense that the legions would eat them out of house and home, but it was dangerous in the longer term sense that Rome might get comfortable with the idea that free Gaul lived to serve them. So Caesar's request for supplies got lost in the mail, or were mistranslated, or couldn't be met because um, we've had a bad harvest. We'll get you what we can on Thursday. Oh, no, no, we mean next Thursday. It didn't take long for Caesar to realize he was being jerked around, and that he was now deep in enemy territory without anything to eat. So he abandoned his pursuit of the Helvetii and made for Biberacti, a fortified allied town in modern Burgundy. The Helvetii got wind of the Roman plight and turned around, the hunted now becoming the hunter. The Romans barely won the race to Bibracti, with the Helvetii cavalry harassing their rear as they approached the town. There turned out to be no time to actually even enter the fort, as the Helvetii smelled blood in the water and pressed an immediate attack. Both sides secured their baggage trains, and on the 20th of June, launched themselves at each other. A full day's fighting, with the outcome forever in doubt, finally gave way to night, as the Romans slowly, methodically, gained the upper hand. The Helvetii, and the Gauls, Celts, and Germans generally, knew of no other way to fight 
than charge en masse and engage in one-on-one -on -one fighting. How else could a warrior distinguish himself and earn the kind of glory so prized by his tribesmen? The Romans, on the other hand, fought in their maniple units, never breaking ranks and working with ruthless mechanical efficiency. It was infuriating to the tribes and a major source of their contempt that they felt towards the Romans. But at the end of a long day, when the Helvetii were exhausted, the legions kept pressing forward. Finally, they broke through and captured the Celtic baggage train. And when you have uprooted your entire civilization and packed it all into a baggage train, the capture of said train means that you have lost everything. The remains of the Helvetii, the women and children, the injured fighters, fled the field. Caesar's legions were so exhausted and had so many dead to bury that they were unable to take up pursuit for three days. But Caesar sent riders out to all the local tribes, threatening dire consequences for anyone who helped the Helvetii fugitives. When they were recovered, the legions set off after the survivors, quickly catching up with what was left of the great Celtic tribe. Those who had survived fell on their knees and begged for clemency. Caesar spared their lives, ordering them to return to Lake Geneva, where they were to remain, serving as a buffer between Roman territory and the forever encroaching Germanic tribes. With no recourse, the Helvetii agreed. Caesar's first major test as a general was a complete success. But he did not have long to bask in the glow of victory, because, speaking of encroaching German tribes, a German tribe was pouring across the Rhine, threatening to overrun the entire country. While Caesar was beating back the Helvetii, political struggles between native Gallic tribes had led one side to call on their cousins across the Rhine to help them out. They knocked on the door of Ariovistus, a great German leader who was more than happy to have an excuse to bring his hundred thousand odd troops into Gaul. The tribe that had called him assumed Ariovistus would help them defeat their enemies and then leave. Ariovistus thought Gaul a nice place to rule, and he turned ruthlessly on nominal Gallic ally and nominal Gallic foe alike. This forced both sides of the internal Gallic struggle to turn to the Romans for aid. And this was a somewhat tricky situation for Caesar, as Ariovistus had already made diplomatic contact with Rome and, with Caesar's support no less, been declared a friend of the Romans. But that did not give the German king carte blanche, and Caesar was already considering Gaul his own personal backyard. He marched northeast towards the Rhine, where the Germans were camped. At this point, Caesar was just coming off an extremely hard-fought battle with the Helvetii, and was in no mood to take on a huge and fresh German army. So his intention was to convince Ariovistus to withdraw back across the Rhine, or at the very least, prevent any more Germans from coming into Gaul. Caesar sent envoys ahead asking for a meeting, but the German king would have none of it. So Caesar sent a note containing the provisions by which the Germans would be allowed to stay in Gaul. No more Germans could cross the river. Any Gallic hostages the Germans held must be returned, and they must agree to not make war on any native Gallic tribe. Ariovistus scoffed at these terms and replied incredulously that it was rich for a Roman general to be making demands so far from his home. If Caesar wanted to force the issue, he was more than welcome to try. While this back and forth was taking place, ever more Germans were invading across the Rhine, and calls for help were coming down from the local Gauls. Caesar knew he had to put a stop to the invasion. His legions could certainly stand to be outnumbered in battle, but there was a practical limit to what they could match. So Caesar moved north through the dense forest west of the Rhine to close the spigot. Marching for days through trees so tightly packed the sun disappeared toward an enemy that was amongst the most feared in the ancient world, the legionnaire's nerves began to waver. With each passing day, stories passed through the ranks about the Germans took on a life of their own until the average foot soldier was convinced that Caesar was marching them to face 15-foot-tall cannibals who breathed fire and used black magic to curse their enemies. Caesar nipped this brewing mutiny in the bud by convening a meeting of his centurions, the veteran soldiers who led the men day to day, in camp and in battle. He shamed them all publicly for doing nothing to stop the growing discord and all but called them cowards for being frightened of a dark forest and some no-account brutes from across the river. The shaming worked, and the dissension in the ranks was quickly silenced. His army fully committed, Caesar closed the final miles between his legions and Ariovistus's massive German army. Upon arrival, Caesar built a fortified camp 
and was surprised to discover that suddenly the Germans were ready to talk. Ariovistus called for a meeting at a neutral site with numerous preconditions, not the least of which being that the two leaders could only be accompanied by cavalry, absolutely no infantry guards. In practice, this meant that Caesar would have with him none of his fellow countrymen, as his cavalry was exclusively made up of Gallic auxiliaries. But Caesar sidestepped this ploy by ordering members of his favorite legion, the Tenth, to mount horses and accompany him. It was from this episode that the Tenth, one of the most famous legions in Roman military history, earned the nickname that they would carry with them for the rest of their existence, the Tenth Mounted Legion. The meeting with Ariovistus was as strange as it was unproductive. The German leader was agitated and belligerent, but refused to commit himself to battle, though he implied that if it did come to battle, that word had come from the Roman Senate that the German had their blessing to wipe Caesar and his legions off the face of the earth. Meanwhile, while the two leaders talked, the German cavalry hurled javelins and stones at the Roman guard. It was obvious that the Romans were being baited, but Caesar refused to bite. As he returned to camp, the one thing he could not figure out was why the Germans did not just attack. They outnumbered the Romans, were in better fighting shape, had better access to supplies, and a superior tactical position. It didn't make a lick of sense. Soon, though, spies in the German camp brought an explanation. The tribal priestesses, who determined through divination whether the gods favored battle or not, had been performing their rites day after day, but kept coming back with a negative answer. Ariovistus himself wanted nothing more than to attack, but he risked the wrath of his gods if he did. Caesar immediately acted on this crucial piece of intelligence and made ready for an immediate assault on the German camp. Once their blood was up, the Germans were sure to fight hard, but maybe their religious hesitation would cause them to flinch or withdraw at the outset. For the outnumbered legions, it was their best hope for total victory. The next day, Caesar launched his full-scale attack. Whether religious concerns played a role in the fighting is unknown, but the Germans certainly didn't act as if their gods didn't want them fighting. However, as with the Helvetii, a full day's hard battle, taking place first on open ground and then on the trampled bodies of the dead, finally began to break the Romans' way. One of the wings, led by Marcus Crassus's son Publius, began to drive the Romans back, finally snapping the enemy line. The Germans broke headline for the Rhine, abandoning imperial dreams in Gaul, and now hoping to simply make it home alive. The 15 miles back to the river was a running slaughter, with Caesar ordering that no prisoners be taken. Ariovistus, displaying great courage and honor, abandoned his wife and daughter to the Romans and escaped on a small raft back to Germania. He never crossed the Rhine again. In one summer, Caesar had destroyed two massive invading forces and was fast making a name for himself as one of the greatest generals in Roman history. Here he was, campaigning where no Roman legion had gone before, defeating the very barbarians who had haunted Roman nightmares from the days of the great sack of Rome 350 years earlier. Caesar, of course, took every opportunity to send home breathless reports from the front line about his extraordinary campaign, his own genius, and the courage of his men. And in the public imagination, Julius Caesar was fast growing into a larger-than-life figure, who would soon eclipse his jealous triumvirate colleagues, Pompey and Crassus. For about a nanosecond, native Gauls held Caesar in the same esteem his fellow Romans did. He had prevented first the marauding Helvetii, and then the fearsome Germans from ransacking their homeland. Think if Caesar had failed, why, they could have been made mere vassals of some invading foreign power. They celebrated Caesar, and then wished him a safe trip back to Roman territory. Thanks for all your help. Maybe we'll call you sometime. But Caesar wasn't going back to Rome, and his army wasn't going anywhere. He ordered the legions to build winter quarters, and then settled in to await the spring. The Gauls quickly realized that Caesar and the Romans were here to stay. Next week, Caesar will use a savvy strategy of divide and conquer to slowly assert Roman dominance over all of Gaul. Along the way, he would become the first Roman general to cross the Rhine River and campaign in Germania, as well as the first Roman to lead an expedition to the mythical island of Britannia. Though the Gauls would eventually organize a resistance and very nearly expel the Romans from their country, Caesar would not be denied his prize, and in a few short years, 
what had forever been a wild land of fearsome barbarians would become just another province in the mighty Roman Empire. Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 41b, The Gallic Wars. Caesar's first year in Gaul had been a great success for both the Romans and the local tribes. Two invading hordes, first the Helvetii and then the Germans, had been repulsed by the legions. Caesar was making a name for himself as a superb commander, and the balance of power among the Gallic tribes had not been upset. So as the winter of 58 BC neared, everyone was happy. But Caesar was not in Gaul simply to act as a bodyguard for independent tribes. He was in Gaul to conquer Gaul. To this end, he did not withdraw back to his provinces on the Italian side of the Alps as the Gauls assumed he would. Instead, he ordered his troops to build winter camps and dig in. These wooden forts dotting the countryside were a visible symbol of Caesar's true intentions. Suddenly, not everyone was so happy. But Caesar was a savvy general and nothing if not a master politician. He knew that the jig was up, that there was no use pretending Rome was not in Gaul to stay, at least not when he met with the leaders of the Gallic tribes in private. Some tribes swore instantly to resist Roman domination, but others were persuaded that conquest was inevitable and the only question was who would enjoy what privileges in the new Roman order. Caesar played rivals against each other, promising to settle ancient scores for one side or the other in exchange for support, intelligence, or troops. What Caesar managed to achieve in the tent prevented the Gauls from ever truly uniting in the field. When the spring of 57 BC came around, the Roman occupation was immediately challenged in the north by a confederation of Belgic tribes. The territory of Belgae, as you could probably guess, covers roughly modern Belgium and was then about as far as you could get from Roman civilization. The tribes in southern Gaul were long accustomed to dealing with the Romans but Italian traders rarely made their way this far north. So it is no great surprise that this would become the epicenter of initial resistance. But Caesar had been able to convince at least one of the Belgic tribes that support for Rome was in their best interest. When this tribe came under attack for their foreign allegiance, Caesar was quick to intervene, hoping to prove that friendship with Rome was not just a one-way street. Those who helped Rome would in turn be helped by Rome. Also, it was a lovely excuse to conquer Belgium. That Caesar had a Belgic ally was the good news. That he only had one Belgic ally was the bad news. He marched the legions north to support his new ally and prevent the Belgae from coalescing into a single force. But he arrived too late and saw to his dismay that a huge army was gathered. Skirmishes broke out and a brief, bloody battle was fought to prevent a portion of the Belgae from circling around behind the Romans. Caesar, outnumbered and deep in enemy territory, had to think fast. Doubtful that he would be able to win a fight in the open, Caesar called for a play that had proved so effective at the end of the Third Samnite War. He ordered squads to fan out across the countryside and sack every settlement they came across. With all their warriors massed in one place, the civilian Belgae were helpless, and soon the whole territory was in flames. With little internal cohesion except a hatred of the Romans to bind them, the Belgic army quickly evaporated as tribes returned home to protect their property. Caesar was now free to march from tribe to tribe and pick them off one by one. Sometimes the locals resisted and were destroyed, but more often than not, they saw the handwriting on the wall and surrendered. One tribe in particular, though, the Nervii, neither surrendered nor were pushovers in the field. At one point, they managed to catch the Romans by surprise as they built a camp, and in the confusion, nearly shattered the legions before Caesar could rally his troops and counterattack. But aside from this one near disaster, the conquest of the Belgae went off without a hitch, and Caesar entered the winter of 57 BC with nearly the whole of Gaul already under his thumb. Over that winter, with the Romans again building camps across the country, Caesar returned to Cisalpine Gaul to attend to his duties there. He was, after all, still the governor, and there was a backlog of high importance action items that he had been neglecting. While on the Italian side of the Alps, Pompey and Crassus left Rome to join Caesar for a conference. The triumvirate was renewed, and it was agreed that Pompey and Crassus would again serve together as co-consuls for the year 55 BC. 
The three men also took the time to divvy up the Roman world between them. Caesar would have his proconsulship of Gaul extended for another five years, and upon completing their term in office, Pompey would be appointed proconsul of Hispania and allowed to govern in absentia, while Crassus would receive the governorship of Syria. This would be the last cooperative venture between the three triumvirs. Crassus would soon lay dead in Syria after a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Parthians, and the familial bond between Caesar and Pompey would soon be shattered by the death of Julia, Caesar's beloved daughter and Pompey's beloved wife. With their agreement in hand, each of the triumvirs went about their business. For Crassus and Pompey, this meant laying the groundwork for their consular campaign, and for Caesar, this meant consolidating his hold over Gaul. But despite his glowing reports to the Senate that Gaul was completely pacified, the reality was not so neat and tidy. This time, trouble came from the Veneti, a maritime tribe from Brittany who decided to take their shot at avoiding Roman domination. Admittedly, they were in a unique position and had good reason to believe they could resist the Romans, but in the end, it was not enough, and they too fell under Caesar's sword. The Veneti's unique position was a mastery of the sea that the Romans could not match. Their forts were all built on narrow spits jutting out into the English Channel, nearly impossible to attack by land, and connected to endless supplies by sea. If Caesar hoped to put down this rebellion, he would have to build a navy. But as we've noted before, the Romans were never great sailors to begin with, even on the relatively calm waters of the Mediterranean. The choppy chaos of the English Channel would prove to be one of the most implacable foes Caesar would ever face, and on more than one occasion, it threatened to end not just his campaign, but his life. After an entire summer of being given the runaround, and losing ships that were no match for the sturdy oak constructions of the Veneti, Caesar finally hit upon the weakness of his enemies. The Veneti ships lacked oars, relying exclusively on sails for maneuverability. Near the end of the year, Caesar sent the whole of his navy, some 200 ships, to attack the main Veneti stronghold. The Veneti were unable to resist the opportunity to crush the Romans once and for all, and sailed out en masse to greet them. But the Romans were prepared and eschewing their failed tactics of ramming and boarding, they instead used hooks to tear down the sails of the Veneti ships. This, coupled with a fortuitous absence of a strong wind, made the Veneti sitting ducks. The Romans went from ship to ship, and though the fighting was long and hard, the outcome was no longer in doubt. The whole of the Veneti navy was destroyed, and the tribal leaders on land, deprived of their supply line, were forced to surrender to Rome. Caesar now controlled almost the entire north coast of Gaul, but he was not content with stopping at the water's edge. Across the channel lay the mythical island of Britannia, which Caesar resolved to invade the following year, both to cut off the aid that had flowed from the island to the rebellious Belgae and the Veneti, but also to score a massive domestic political coup. Think of the headlines, Caesar conquers the ends of the earth. It has a nice ring to it. But before he could invade the ends of the earth, Caesar would be forced to engage in a less romantic, though arguably more important, venture. And, as it would turn out, the Roman public was at least as impressed with Caesar for leading a Roman army into Germania as they were for his later invasion of Britain. In 55 BC, German tribes began crossing the Rhine River and running amok. Often encouraged by the local Gauls, who hoped to stir up as much trouble for Rome as they could, Caesar was forced to put his British invasion on hold while he headed east to secure the border. What he immediately intuited was that the Germans would have no fear as long as they believed the Rhine was a magical barrier to Roman advancement. So Caesar decided to put lie to that particular myth. But, understanding that the optics demanded something altogether more spectacular than crossing his legionnaires on rickety boats, Caesar ordered a bridge be built across the Great River. In what is widely acknowledged as one of the great feats in the history of military engineering, Caesar's army designed and built his bridge in just 10 days. Stable in the rushing water and strong enough to sustain the 40,000 troops Caesar intended to march into Germania, the bridge was an architectural masterpiece, but, more importantly for Caesar's immediate concerns, it scared the bejesus out of the Germans. They had felt themselves completely safe on their side of the river, secure in the knowledge that the Romans, A, were afraid of invading Germania, B, 
would be easy targets if they tried to cross the river in boats. And C, couldn't build a bridge so fast that the Germans wouldn't be able to simply mass an army to meet the invaders. But in the time it took German scouts to notice the bridge and report it to their chiefs, the Romans were already hammering in the final nails. When the next round of scouts arrived to check the progress of the construction, they were forced to immediately turn around and report the unbelievable news that the Romans were already across the Rhine. The Germans panicked and retreated into the dense forest. Caesar spent three weeks marching around western Germany without encountering any resistance. Believing he had made his point, he ordered his troops back across the Rhine and the bridge burned. The Germans did not miss the point. Rome could go where it wanted, when it wanted, and it was best not to forget that fact. Despite the time he had spent on his detour into Germania, Caesar was determined to launch at least a preliminary expedition to Britain by the end of the year. So, with the autumn winds howling and winter fast approaching, Caesar set out with 80 ships to find out how much resistance he could expect if he decided to launch a full invasion, or if a full invasion would even be necessary. This first crossing can't really be described as anything but a debacle. Caesar had been unable to squeeze any decent information out of the local traders about where and when to land on the island, but what minimal scout work his own officers had done was totally inadequate. Not only did the Romans have no clue how to handle things like tides, but at every possible landing site they found themselves met by thousands of British warriors lining the cliffs. Finally, with great difficulty, Caesar was able to land his fleet and establish a small beachhead. But as soon as his ships were anchored, a storm swept in, smashing his fleet against the rocks. The beleaguered Caesar made contact with the local tribes and tried to put on a brave face but it was obvious to anyone with eyes that the Romans posed no threat whatsoever. The local Britons indulged Caesar's pompous demands that they send hostages to secure the goodwill of Rome and return to their tribes, promising that, yeah, they'd get right on that. Caesar didn't even wait for them not to comply, generously agreeing to accept the hostages in Gaul rather than forcing the Britons to respond right this very second. He patched up his fleet as fast as he could and sailed back to Gaul. Only two British tribes actually sent their promised hostages. The next spring, though, Caesar launched a far better planned invasion. The Romans never did get a handle on the tricky tides of the North Atlantic, but they were able to land without as much difficulty and establish a proper base. This time, Caesar arrived not with 80 ships, but 800 ships. The southern Britons were forced to take this threat a little more seriously but they still proved to be a hard bunch to get a handle on. They all willingly agreed to submit to Rome, but took every opportunity to undermine the Roman presence and showed little stomach for the kind of real, actual submission the Romans were used to. The Britons seemed to be treating the Romans as little more than a temporary nuisance, shining on the invaders until they lost interest and went home. Caesar pressed inland and met with fiercer resistance, but primarily in the form of guerrilla attacks, rather than open battle. Eventually, a Caesar learned who was directing the resistance and put their stronghold to siege. Failing to land a counterpunch on the Roman camp and draw Caesar away, the resistance ended and the besieged tribe agreed to recognize a king of Caesar's choosing. Anxious to get back to Gaul, Caesar left the islands in the hands of local allies. It would be another hundred years before Rome returned to fully incorporate Britannia as a province. The expedition had resulted in little material gain, but in terms of publicity, the invasion was a huge success for Caesar personally. There was nothing, it seemed, that the charismatic general could not do. Caesar returned to Gaul and settled in for a long winter. His heart was heavy with grief, and his mind was racked by dread at news he had received while he was in Britain. His daughter Julia had died in childbirth. The death of his only child affected the passionate Caesar mightily, but he further struggled with the implications this had on his alliance with Pompey. With Crassus in Syria, Pompey stood alone as the dominant triumvir in Rome, and now had nothing to bind his interest to Caesar's. But the sullen general did not have long to dwell on his grief or his political future. In northeast Gaul, a full legion was tricked out of their winter quarters by supposedly friendly locals lured into a trap 
and slaughtered to a man. But this was not news that Caesar would learn until after he got word that another camp was under siege by the same group, whose ranks now swelled with warriors from all over the country who wanted nothing more than to kill Romans. The besieged camp was led by one of Caesar's ablest commanders, Quintus Cicero, brother of the great orator. Quintus had not fallen for the ruse that had lured out the slaughtered legion from their camp, and despite the satisfaction of seeing through the trick, he was now surrounded by a rebel Gallic army and unable to get word through the line that he was under attack. Finally, a slave agreed to slip through and make contact with Caesar in exchange for his freedom. Once alerted, Caesar immediately charged out into the winter snows to relieve the besieged legion and arrived just in time. The sight of Caesar's army scattered the rebels and Cicero's legion was saved. Nearly every soldier trapped inside the liberated camp had been wounded in some fashion or another, and Caesar praised them all to the hilt, handing out awards and honors left and right. It was not lost on these men, nor on the men who had done the liberating, that Caesar seemed to genuinely care about the average soldiers under his command. Throughout the campaign, Caesar famously referred to his men not as soldier, but as comrade. These simple acts of familiarity and compassion helped breed in his troops the fanatical loyalty that would prove decisive in the coming civil war. These men were never Roman legionaries. They were Caesar's legionaries. When the spring of 53 BC came, Caesar had one thing on his mind, revenge. He brought the full weight of his army down on northeast Gaul and engaged in a genocidal campaign against the tribes that were behind the assault on Cicero's men and, the Romans had later learned with horror, the murder of the tricked legion. Without remorse, Caesar slaughtered the men and sold the women and children into slavery. During this year in the field, Caesar also built a second bridge across the Rhine to halt aid and comfort that was coming in from Germania. He hoped to achieve not only a measure of revenge, but also signal that Gaul was no longer a free country, and that any attack on Rome would be met with the swiftest and most brutal repercussions. In this, he was not entirely successful, as the brutality of 53 BC proved to those Gauls who still had fight in them that they had better do something now, or they would all wind up like their annihilated cousins in the north. But in a larger sense, the campaign was effective. It galvanized the last of the independent-minded Gauls, and when Caesar defeated them the following summer, all formal resistance was wiped out with them. But on the cusp of this great victory, Caesar's political fortunes in Rome were quickly spinning out of control. He had offered his grandniece Octavia, the sister of the future Caesar Augustus, to Pompey in marriage in an attempt to re-secure their alliance. But Pompey spurned the offer and instead agreed to wed the daughter of one of Caesar's most hated enemies, a man named Quintus Metellus Scipio. This was not a good sign. On top of that, Marcus Crassus, long Caesar's benefactor, died fighting in a disastrous campaign in the east. The triumvirate was literally and figuratively dead. But there was no time to worry about domestic political concerns. In 52 BC, the last great battle of the Gallic Wars was set to be fought. Since he had arrived in Gaul five years earlier, Caesar had effectively used Gallic tribal rivalries to his advantage and avoided ever facing a united front. Now, though, with the noose finally closing around their necks, the Gauls joined forces under the banner of Vercingetorix, a Gallic king who would lead the last stand for his country's independence. I hope I'm not giving away the ending when I say that Vercingetorix would meet his end after being paraded through Rome in chains during Caesar's triumph. Cause of death? Unceremonious strangulation in a Roman jail cell. Prior to this ignoble end, however, he was the last best hope of the Gauls and would cause as much grief to Caesar in one summer as the Roman general had experienced during his entire occupation of the country. In the dead of winter, the Gallic king launched his rebellion by embarking on a storched earth campaign. The Romans had been living off the land since their arrival, allowing them greater mobility and freedom from worries about protecting a supply line. Now, Vercingetorix put as many towns and granaries as possible to the torch. It was cruel and punished his own people as much as it punished the Romans, but this was a time for desperate measures. He was persuaded, however, to spare Avaricum, the greatest city in southern Gaul, 
a decision he was uncomfortable with and would soon regret. Caesar gathered his scattered legions and headed straight for the great city. Despite assurances from the Gallic nobility that Avaricum was impregnable, Vercingetorix was forced to watch helplessly as the city fell after a brutal 30-day siege. Caesar's starving soldiers killed everyone in the city. Most importantly, they had secured enough food to see them through the next few weeks. The Gauls retreated, and as soon as he resupplied his army, Caesar followed. A series of feints and counterfeints finally saw the Romans chase the Gauls behind the walls of Dragovia. This time, however, overzealous Roman soldiers attacked too early, despite Caesar's order to restrain themselves, and blew the one chance that they had to take the city. Forced to retreat after sustaining serious casualties, the Romans had more to worry about than simply licking their wounds. The defeat at Gergovia had broken the aura of invincibility surrounding Caesar, and the tribes across the country, including some of the most steadfast Roman supporters, flocked to Vercingetorix's banner. Caesar was facing the fight of his life. The whole country was now in revolt, and if he was forced to retreat to Roman territory, he was sure to be stripped of his command by enemies in the Senate. So, rather than fall back to the south, Caesar ordered his shocked troops to move north. At this desperate hour, Caesar caught one of his many lucky breaks. Engaging in a brief battle, little more than a skirmish, the Romans got the better of an attacking Gallic force. The defeat spooked Vercingetorix, and rather than staying on the offensive, he ordered his army of 80,000 to retreat to the walled city of Alesia. Caesar saw his fortune change at once. Alesia was a hill fort located between two rivers, and though it would be nearly impossible to storm, it was also nearly impossible to keep it resupplied. All he had to do was ring the city and prevent any relief from getting through. After that, it was just a matter of waiting for those trapped inside to surrender. So Caesar ordered a wall built around the entire city. The Gauls inside launched attacks to try and halt the construction, but the Romans fought them off and kept building. Soon, the city was encircled and the waiting game began. But then word came of a new wrinkle. A relief army, estimated at some 60,000, was on its way. Caesar, thinking fast and unwilling to lose his opportunity to force Vercingetorix's surrender, ordered a second wall be built, this one facing out towards the oncoming army. Once this wall was completed, the Roman army's whole world collapsed to the few hundred yards between the two walls. The game now boiled down to who would relent first. The Romans were not well stocked, but those trapped in Alesia were already starving to death. The commander of the newly arrived Gallic army knew Vercingetorix would not be able to hold out much longer, so he launched a full-scale attack at a weak point in the outer wall. The legions massed to repel the assault, but slowly began to lose ground. Fearing that the day and the whole campaign might be slipping away, Caesar personally led his cavalry out from behind the walls and circled around behind the Gauls. Suddenly surrounded, the Gauls panicked and broke apart in disarray. Inside Alesia, Vercingetorix watched with resignation as his rebellion came to an end. There was no hope of lifting the siege now. The next day, the Gallic king rode out of the city on his horse and surrendered to Caesar, hoping to spare as many of his people as possible from future reprisals. The siege of Alesia, which ended in October of 52 BC, marked the end of organized resistance to Roman rule in Gaul. Caesar had achieved everything he had set out to do, conquering vast new territories for Rome, exploring lands heretofore unknown, and making himself an incredibly wealthy and famous man. He hoped that his victories would earn him safe passage back to Rome and freedom from prosecution once he arrived there, but I think we all know that this was never meant to be. Next week, we will bring the rest of the players in this greatest of Roman dramas up to that fateful year of 49 BC. While Caesar was in Gaul, Crassus had started a war with, and then been destroyed by, the Parthians. Pompey had slowly moved into the senatorial camp after his consulship ended. Cicero had been banished and then unbanished from the city, while Cato had been forced to take an unwanted command in Cyprus by Clodius, whose free grain program excited the masses, distressed the Senate, and eventually led to the populist Hellraiser's murder, a murder that would spark riots 
as rival gangs took to the streets to battle one another for control of the city. Rome was quickly descending into violent anarchy, and when the great general Caesar finally arrived and put the city under his thumb, many welcomed him not with fear, but with relief, never realizing that the stability Caesar promised came at the price of their freedom. Hello, and welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 42, Meanwhile, Back in Rome. After completing his conquest of Gaul, Julius Caesar entered into a sort of holding pattern. The Senate refused to let him return to Rome until he disbanded his army, but Caesar refused to return unless he was allowed to keep his army. It was a critical moment, not just for Caesar, but for the fate of the whole Roman world. We all know what happened or we will shortly. But before we get into that tense showdown, I want to wind the clock back a few years. Though the war in Gaul is unquestionably the most famous thing to have occurred in the decade, the rest of Rome did not simply stop what they were doing and wait for another dispatch from mighty Caesar. Indeed, it would be difficult to understand why Caesar felt he was forced to cross the Rubicon without understanding what had happened in his absence. It was a decade that saw the death of Crassus after one of Rome's greatest military defeats the breaking of the triumvirate, and increasing civil unrest in the city as both the populist tribunes and the conservative senate grew more inflexible and radicalized. Rome and Caesar were on a collision course that would destroy the 500-year-old republic. You may recall that near the end of his consulship in 59 BC, Caesar sponsored the adoption of a one Mr. Clodius Pulcher by a plebeian allowing the flamboyant demagogue to abandon his patrician status and run for tribune. This was in retaliation for the sharp attack Cicero had publicly leveled against Caesar, as Clodius was one of the great orator's most bitter enemies. The whole adoption was completely illegal for a laundry list of reasons, but you may have noticed that the rule of law did not count for much in Rome these days. Once Clodius was in a position of authority, the deal was that he would go after Cicero full bore, and make him realize that messing with Caesar was very bad for his health. But, of course, once he was off his leash, there was little stopping Clodius from making everyone realize that messing with Clodius was bad for everyone's health. Immediately upon attaining the tribunate, Clodius passed a law making exile the punishment for killing a Roman citizen without trial. There was absolutely no doubt who the intended target of the law was, as this was exactly what Cicero had done when putting down the Catiline conspiracy. Once the law was passed, Clodius and the growing gang of thugs whom he surrounded himself with drummed up popular support for the banishment of Cicero from Rome. At first, Cicero could scarcely believe that the gambit would work and turned to his friends in the Senate for support, and specifically to Pompey, to put a stop to the craziness. But the word had gone out that the triumvirate supported Clodius' vendetta against Cicero. Though neither Caesar nor Pompey necessarily supported banishing Cicero, they felt compelled to follow through on what they had set in motion. When Pompey refused to speak on Cicero's behalf, the craziness became reality. In 58 BC, no doubt still reeling in disbelief, Cicero packed up and sailed for Macedonia, unsure if he would ever see Rome again. It was, by his own admission, the lowest moment of his life, and he confessed that during his exile, suicide crossed his mind on more than one occasion. With Cicero out of the way, Clodius next set his sights on Cato. The triumvirate had far fewer misgivings about getting rid of the moralizing teetotaler and embraced Clodius' scheme to remove the powerful senator from Rome. Clodius, who obviously saw politics through a highly personal lens, hatched a plot to take care of two enemies at once. When he was a young man, Clodius, like Caesar, had been taken hostage by Cilician pirates. The young patrician had demanded that the king of nearby Cyprus pay the ransom, but the king had refused to come to the aid of this demanding young nobody, earning the lifelong enmity of Clodius, who now, suddenly, was somebody. So now, after years of nursing a grudge, Clodius had his revenge. He passed a law stripping Cyprus of its client kingdom status and annexing it officially into the empire. 
He then nominated Cato as the perfect candidate to govern the new territory, what with his well-known administrative skills and reputation for honesty, etc., etc. Cato was flummoxed. He couldn't say no to the appointment, but did not want to leave the city at this critical hour. It was clear that Rome was being taken over by lawless thugs, who would destroy all that was good and pure about Rome if they were not checked. But like Cicero before him, he could find no one who would help him avoid this de facto banishment. So Cato left Rome, the king of Cyprus was deposed, and Clodius patted himself on the back. This was almost too easy. For his next trick, Clodius introduced Rome to something that, at the time, was highly controversial, hence the need to get rid of Cato and Cicero, but would soon become an undislodgeable cornerstone of public policy, the free grain dole. The overpopulation and underemployment in the city was a source of constant worry and tension for middle and upper class Romans. With more than a million people now crammed on top of one another, everyone was aware that if these people were not fed, the richest, most powerful city of the ancient world would likely be consumed by its own hungry citizens. To this end, it had been policy since the days of the Gracchi to sell grain at a heavily subsidized price, but Clodius decided to take it one step further. He pointed out to the teeming masses that they all lived in, well, the richest, most powerful city in the world, and it was a gross injustice that the nobles lived such splendid lives, enjoying all the luxuries that empire afforded, while they lived in such squalor, barely able to feed themselves. Veterans who had fought to win the empire that now sustained the rich deserved better. Farmers who had been displaced by slaves so the rich could make more money deserved better. Urban citizens who had seen their standard of living deteriorate because of the influx into the city of the former two groups deserved better. They all deserved better. The mobs were eager to buy what Clodius was selling because Clodius wasn't planning to sell them anything. He was planning to give them stuff for free. And nothing says popular like free stuff. So Clodius was able to push through his free grain allotments, which ultimately served some 200,000 poor citizens of Rome. Augustus would consider repealing the grain dole during his reign, but ultimately decided against it. Once given, it is hard to take away, and it simply wasn't worth the price of feeding the masses to risk revolution. Free grain was here to stay. But despite his efforts to neutralize his enemies, Clodius was not operating in a political vacuum. In 57 BC, after just a single year in exile, good thing he didn't kill himself, a movement began to have Cicero recalled to Rome. The faction was led by Titus Aeneas Milo, a Publian agitator who had previously worked in support of Pompey, but who now aligned himself with the conservative Senate against the Triumvirate. Milo was, further, personal friends with Cicero. He was elected tribune alongside Clodius in 57 BC and made it a priority to bring his friend home. The rivalry between Clodius and Milo would define Roman street politics for the next few years. Both controlled gangs of former soldiers and gladiators who could be mobilized at a moment's notice to support this or that proposal. Violent clashes and small-scale riots became a frequent feature of Roman life as the heads of these rival gangs fought physically where once words had been the weapon of choice. The degeneration of discourse from verbal sparring to literal sparring would be the catalyst for Pompey's elevation to a near dictatorship, which we will get to in a moment. Milo, despite Clodius's attempts to physically halt the proceedings, managed to lift the judgment on Cicero, and in the summer of 57 BC, the senator was welcomed back to Italy by an adoring crowd much to his happy surprise. But his return to Rome was bittersweet. In his absence, Clodius had confiscated Cicero's estates, both in the country and on the Palatine Hill, and had them demolished. While Cicero returned from Greece, Milo had directed workers to begin rebuilding his friend's home, and the construction site became the scene of multiple violent clashes as Clodius sent in his thugs to disrupt the effort. Eventually, the running battles between Clodius and Milo would turn deadly, and one would wind up dead and the other exiled. But before we get to that, we need to turn to Caesar's triumvirate colleagues who, as you'll recall, were preparing themselves to be co-consuls in 55 BC. The consular elections of 56 BC, which saw Crassus and Pompey victorious, would take records amount of bribery to pull off. 
Opposition to the triumvirate, it seemed, was unifying and solidifying, and it was getting more and more difficult for the three men to simply assert their will. Thus, the consulship of Pompey and Crassus was centered on the question of each man's future. As agreed, they extended Caesar's proconsulship in Gaul for another five years, which would leave him immune to prosecution through 49 BC. This was of the utmost importance, as it would get Caesar through the mandated 10-year waiting period between consulships. Caesar believed that if he could survive until the second consulship, he could do enough in that term to insulate himself from prosecution for the rest of his life. After easing Caesar's troubled mind, they looked out for themselves. Crassus would be assigned to the governorship of Syria for a period of five years, and Pompey would be given Spain for the same length of time. The two men saw their eventual proconsulships from entirely different perspectives. Pompey, for his part, made sure that he would be allowed to rule his province without actually having to go there. He was getting up there in years and had already fought his way to the ends of the known world and come home triumphant. He was fast losing interest in the world of war and politics. All he wanted to do now was retire in Rome with his young bride, Julia. The governorship of Spain was meant to leave him with a steady income, not to afford any opportunities for further glory. He was, after all, Pompey the Great. What more did he have left to prove? Crassus, on the other hand, though he was even older than Pompey, still dreamed of a triumph, something that would fill the gaping hole in his record. His youthful exploits at the Battle of the Coline Gate had long been forgotten, and his victory over Spartacus had come almost 20 years before. When people thought of Pompey, they thought of his great military victories. When they thought of Crassus, they thought of the fact that they had to pay him rent every month. Great monuments are built for the former, not so much the latter. So, in late 55 BC, Crassus set out for Syria to build himself a great army so he could invade Parthia, while Pompey set out for the kitchen to make himself a nice snack and take a nap. Throughout 54 BC, Crassus used his personal wealth to raise seven legions in Syria, some 35,000 to 40,000 troops. At his request, and with Caesar's approval, Crassus's son Publius was released from service in Gaul and rode to meet his father at the head of a thousand Celtic cavalrymen. Crassus trained his army, drilled his army, and re-drilled his army until they were in fighting shape. He couldn't wait to get his expedition started, identifying the next spring as the latest he wanted to get going. But Crassus's impatience would prove to be his undoing and lead him to make a disastrous strategic decision right at the outset. The buffer state Armenia, which Pompey had secured peaceful relationships with the decade before, agreed to help Crassus in his quest to peel off territory from the Parthians. The Armenian king pledged 50,000 troops. The only stipulation was that Crassus had to come north and invade Parthia via Armenia. Basically, the king wanted Crassus to swing through and pick up the Armenian army on his way to the front. But Crassus refused to delay, and after crossing the Euphrates River and finding himself welcomed by the Hellenized natives, decided he was better off making immediately for bigger fish, rather than going back to get the Armenians. But the natives Crassus initially encountered were not so much friendly as they were treacherous. A local chieftain told Crassus that the Parthians were scattered and afraid of the invading Romans. But the chieftain was a Parthian plant, and when he agreed to show Crassus the best route to the great Parthian cities, it was not hard to imagine what happened next. In actuality, the Parthians were not scattered and afraid. They were concentrated and confident. The Parthian army headed for Armenia to punish the conspiring Armenian king, while their plant in the Roman army was ordered to lead Crassus around the desert aimlessly. Just to make sure that the Romans did not link up with the Armenians, 10,000 Parthian cavalry were sent south to further harass the legions. But it would turn out that the attempt to delay Crassus would prove to be far more successful than anyone could have dreamed. The 10,000 cavalry was about to crush Crassus's army of some 40,000. After being led away from the Euphrates, the Roman army marched day after day through the sweltering desert heat. Morale was low, and the troops grumbled that Crassus had no idea what he was doing, no idea where he was going, and that he was going to get them all killed. On all three fronts, they were exactly correct. 
At Kerry, near the modern border of Syria and Turkey, the Parthian cavalry appeared on the horizon. Ignoring advice from his officers about where to fight, when to fight, and how to fight, Crassus ordered his exhausted troops to form into a giant square, with cavalry protecting each wing. At first, the Romans, despite their misgivings about Crassus, were fairly confident. It was, after all, only 10,000 Parthians. But of those, 9,000 were highly mobile and highly accurate archers, while the other 1,000 were heavily armored troops called cataphracts. The Parthian light cavalry opened up the attack. They would charge the Romans at full speed, firing arrows the whole time. Then, as soon as they got near the line, they would wheel around and speed off, continuing to fire arrows over their shoulder as they went. And this last maneuver was called a Parthian shot, or, as we know it today, a parting shot. It had the effect of never letting up on the constant barrage of arrows. Crassus kept his men in formation, shields facing all directions, and the arrows mostly bounced off harmlessly. But as I'm sure you can imagine, the constant attack took its toll mentally. Crassus's brilliant strategy was to simply outlast the arrow supply of the Parthians and hope they would leave the Romans alone after that. At one point, however, afraid that he would be surrounded, Crassus ordered his son to lead out the Celtic cavalry to drive off an encircling force. The superior Parthian cavalry, however, led Publius and his men far away from the main Roman force, then suddenly wheeled around and attacked. Helpless, Crassus watched as his cavalry and his son were slaughtered. Despondent, he fumbled around trying to decide what to do next, eventually coming to the conclusion that he needed to march forward and attack. But before he could make any positive move, the armored cataphracts attacked. The exhausted and heat-stroked Roman front line was smashed, and the whole army was split in two. Crassus was forced to order a retreat. 10,000 of his men were cut off from the rest of the army and cut down. The Romans withdrew, but were led astray again and again by supposedly friendly locals. Finally, the Parthian commander sent word that he would talk terms with Crassus. The Roman soldiers basically told their general to go talk, or they would kill him where he stood. Crassus, completely deflated, agreed. He entered the Parthian camp to discuss peace, but whether by design or accident, a fight broke out, and in the melee, Crassus was killed. Legend has it that the Parthians, well aware that they were dealing with Rome's richest and greediest leader, poured molten gold down his throat and kept the skull as a trophy. The legions, meanwhile, discovered that they had been led into a swamp, and, getting word that their leader had been murdered, tried to escape, but the flight was a disaster. Between the battle at Cary and the retreats, Rome lost some 20,000 troops with another 10,000 taken prisoner. Of the 40,000 who had marched out just weeks before, only 10,000 limped back to Syria under the command of Gaius Cassius. Yeah, that Cassius. It was the worst Roman defeat since the disaster at Cannae during the Second Punic War. And more embarrassing than the loss itself was the capture of numerous legionary eagle standards. It was a source of almost immeasurable shame for the legionary symbols to fall into the hands of the enemy. Caesar Augustus spent a great deal of diplomatic time and energy trying to recover the captured eagles from the Parthians, and when he finally got them back, the reaction in Rome was the same as if he had actually won a great battle. The defeat at Cary also firmly solidified in the minds of most Romans that it was folly to try and expand further east. Many had opposed Crassus's mission to begin with, and took the loss as proof that Rome ought to stick near the Mediterranean. Mark Antony's later disastrous misadventures in the region would further drive home the point that sound policy was living in peaceful coexistence with whatever empire controlled the mountains and deserts of the east. It was not until the Emperor Trajan, some 150 years later, that Rome would again risk war in the east. And even then, Trajan's successor Hadrian basically abandoned all the territory Trajan had won, deeming it far too expensive to try and hold. Rome was, and would remain, a Mediterranean empire. I will also mention in passing that to the Romans at the time, the doomed campaign in the east was defined not by the death of Marcus Crassus, but by the death of his son Publius. The young man, too young to even begin his path on the cursus honorum, had already proved himself to be a great leader while serving in the Gallic Wars, 
and many Romans felt that the early death of this popular and charismatic leader was one of the great tragedies of the day. It is intriguing to wonder what role a formidable Publius Crassus would have played in the coming civil wars. But for Caesar, the death of Marcus was still by far the greater tragedy. It had the effect of officially ending the first triumvirate. With Julia's death in 54 BC, the ties that bound Caesar and Pompey were already strained. Crassus's death officially ended the partnership. Caesar, as I mentioned before, attempted to salvage the relationship by offering Pompey his niece Octavia, but Pompey decided to marry Publius Crassus's young widow, who just so happened to be the daughter of one of Caesar's greatest enemies, Quintus Metellus Scipio. Yes, the triumvirate was broken. Beyond this breach, Rome in general began to turn on Caesar. In December of 53 BC, a chance passing in the streets of Clodius and Milo led to a fight breaking out among their entourages. In the scuffle, Clodius was killed. This not only deprived Caesar of a key ally in the city, but it also sparked a wave of riots. In a display of shocking lawlessness, the supporters of Clodius actually seized control of the Senate House and used it as a funeral pyre for their dead leader, burning the entire structure to the ground. So, when you go to Rome and visit the Forum and discover to your disappointment that you can't actually see the spot where Julius Caesar was assassinated because the Senate was meeting somewhere else for a few years, blame Clodius. Well, at least his supporters. Boo, Clodius' supporters. Boo. The riots led the Senate to reach out to Pompey. A strong hand was needed before things spun out of control. But wary of giving Pompey full dictatorial powers, they instead split the difference and appointed him emergency consul without a colleague. Pompey managed to restore order, but moving beyond the immediate crisis, the Senate pushed him to deal with the next crisis, which they all saw looming. Caesar had just emerged completely victorious in the Gallic Wars and was sitting in Gaul with 50,000 battle-hardened veterans. The Senate was itching to strip Caesar of his command and punish him for all the terrible things he had done, real or imagined. But obviously, Caesar wasn't just going to roll over, so a tense showdown began, with both sides refusing to blink. Pompey pushed the envelope first, by passing a law allowing for retroactive prosecution for bribery, putting the Senate on firm legal footing to go after Caesar when he returned to Rome. Next, the Senate demanded that Caesar stand down his legions, now that, by his own admission, the war in Gaul was won. Caesar countered this by saying that that was fine as long as he was allowed to stand for consular election in absentia. Pompey responded by answering that no, he would not be granted any such concession, and further, he would not be allowed to stand for election at all unless his army was disbanded. Caesar said that that was fine, he would give up his army as soon as Pompey gave up his. But as Pompey's army was slowly but surely transforming into the army of the Republic, the Senate refused to let Pompey agree to these terms. They demanded Caesar disband his army, or he would be declared an enemy of the state. Here, then, was the final break. Despite the best efforts of Cicero and the other moderates, the two sides had dug themselves in too deep. There was no way Caesar was coming back to Rome without the protection of either his army or the imperium that came with the consulship, and the Senate was not going to let him have either of those things. Over the winter of 50 BC, Caesar considered his options. The personal feud between himself and the Senate had now grown into a full-blown constitutional crisis, and there was no way of knowing what the outcome of any given decision he made would be. Should he try to broker a deal through Cicero, recognize that he was outnumbered and capitulate, or should he just go all in and march back to Rome with his army? Next week, I think we all know what Caesar decides to do. Mm -hmm.